Hello, and welcome to the Creative Solutions Podcast. I'm your host, Isolde Trachtenberg. Thank you so much for being here for a very, very special encore episode. Uh, a dear friend of mine, Grammy Award winning, Indie Award winning, incredible musician, guitarist, artist, photographer, and so many other things, Al Petaway succumbed to cancer in September. And he was on my show uh, in 2020. And we talked about all things music and all things art. And it was an amazing episode. Al is responsible for the way I play guitar in many ways. He's responsible for how I am on stage. In addition to my high school music director, uh, Mary Alice Powell, Al was one of my early influences, especially in guitar playing Celtic fingerstyle. He's a Celtic fingerstyle god. And uh, and he, he succumbed to cancer in late September. And I thought about what I should talk about with respect to him, his life. I can tell you about my favorite albums of his, A Whispering Stones, Waters in the Wild, Racing Hearts, with his beloved wife and partner, Amy White, uh, and uh, Caledon Wood. He did still, she was on it, but it was still listed as him solo. Uh, Gratitude, so many, so many incredible albums. Al was also an amazing teacher. He taught many of the greats. He was a sideman with many of the greats. He won Grammys uh, because he was one of the greats and, uh, you know, listed as one of the top 50 guitar players ever. Uh, and I would say higher than that, I would say maybe in the top five or 10. Anyway, I want to give you an opportunity to hear him and listen to his music because he gave me permission and some a couple of his pieces of, that are two of my favorites are in the episode. And this is back when the podcast was still called the Innovative Mindset Podcast. It has been renamed a couple of different times because I keep sort of funneling down, narrowing down my exact interest. My interest nowadays is to talk to creatives about how they're changing the paradigm, how they're shifting the way we think and what we know and what we do, all with an eye towards changing the world for the better. And Al is one of those people. And uh, I, I just, I'm going to replay that episode in its entirety for you because it's absolutely worth hearing him and his thoughts on creativity and artistry, music, and really the transitions that you have to make from someone who has a day job because you've got a family, all the way to being a full-time musician and what it means when you do that, when you actualize that dream. The last uh, 20 some odd years of uh, his life, he and Amy have lived in the mountains of Western North Carolina and which is perfect for them. And I send my condolences and my love out to you, Amy, if you should ever happen to hear this episode, because I know that Al is your heart mate, your soul mate, your music mate. He's he's your mate. And I know that this must be just uh, an unbearable time for you. So I, I want to send you my love and send you this moment in time captured two hours, just about two hours of my conversation with Al Petaway, musician, teacher, husband, father, artist, grandfather, and friend. I hope you enjoy it. You get enough feedback that you want to um, sort of pursue it while you still can, while you're still young. And for us, it was just, I mean, we were in love, but we were in love musically as well as physically, emotionally, we're in love with each other's music. Hello, and welcome to the Creative Mindset Podcast. I'm your host, Isolde Trachtenberg. In the show, my guests and I explore how we can use creativity to do our best work and live our best lives. I talk with authors, musicians, actors, scientists, and others who are all pushing the envelope to live fully, creatively, and authentically. Listen in to get the scoop on how you can do it too. Hello, and welcome to the Creative Mindset Podcast. My name is Isolde Trachtenberg, and I am super thrilled you're here. And I'm so excited about my guest today. 
First of all, he's an old dear friend, which is amazing. He and his fabulous wife played at my wedding, which is also amazing. I want to introduce you to Al Petaway. He is a Grammy and Indie Award winner, best known for his lyrical and powerful fingerstyle acoustic guitar playing heard on dozens of recordings, instructional videos, film soundtracks, and like PBS documentaries by Ken Burns, most notably the Emmy winning film, The National Parks, America's Best Idea, which they are America's Best Idea. Let's, let's call it what it is. Al's compositions are, str I love that you're laughing about that because it's true. Uh, it is true. <laughs> See, he's already here, just so you know. Al's compositions are strongly influenced by the Celtic folk rock and blues styles he's performed in the studio and on stage with many of the best known artists in those genres. He was voted one of the top 50 acoustic guitarists of all time. I would say much higher than just the top 50, but maybe that's, that's the way they titled it, by the readers of Acoustic Guitar Magazine. And for more than 20 years, he's coordinated the Guitar Week program of the Swan or Noah Gathering Summer Music Camp near Asheville, North Carolina, which I've been to and it's fabulous. You're gonna have to go if you are at all a music nerd, you're gonna have to go. Al lives high in the mountains with his wife and musical partner, Amy White, along with an endlessly entertaining variety of domestic and wild critters. Welcome to the show, Al. Hi, Zolda. How have you been? <laughs> <laughs> I know. We've just spent the last few minutes catching up, so it's just really, it's like, and now we're going to talk about, about other things. So, and it's funny because what it, what's interesting to me about this all, you're, you're one of my absolute favorite musicians in the history of time. I have to say that. But when I first met you, when we were bo both working at the National Geographic Society, I knew you as a photographer and a photos guy before I knew you as a musician. And I remember the National Geographic had an event where we could come and see some of the creative work other creative staff members were doing. And we could purchase like gifts for the holiday season. And you were there with two albums on CD, Whispering Stones and The Waters in the Wild. And they're both still two of my favorite mm. albums ever, which, you know, ah, and we can, we're going to talk about those songs in a bit. But I, but I wanted to ask you something. When you started, when you started way back when, you had, I guess, probably more than the two interests of photography and music, but, but let's start talking about that, if you would. What drew you to them? What drew you to music? What drew you to photography? What got you started? Oh, well, music, I think I was drawn to, you know, most of my life. I started playing guitar when I was around 10 or something, nine or 10. And, you know, I was a big Beatles fan. I did the whole that was my time period, you know, I was, uh, I just remember wanting to learn all their songs. And then of course my dad, um, was a big Chet Atkins fan. And so he wanted me to, uh, be more like Chet Atkins. So there was, <laughs> so that, that was kind of a, that, that was an interesting story too, because I, he, I went to him and I said, you know, I, I've been playing for a little while now. And this is when I was about, I don't know, 11 or 12. And I said, um, can I have a can I get a good guitar you know because I was playing this cheap little Sears thing that was really horrible and um, he said well I'll get you a good guitar would you learn how to play like Chet Atkins huh. so that was his that was his uh, thing and he didn't realize that I would take him seriously and I went and I learned two of Chet Atkins tunes and then um, went and played them for him and he you know true to his word he took me to the to the store and you know let me pick out a guitar because I picked out one he didn't like. So I had, to <laughs> <laughs> he wanted me to get a more expensive one. So that was really nice. <clears throat> but anyway, so that, the, so the guitar has been in my life pretty much, you know, ever since I can remember. Um, and before that I was of course playing drum, drum, you know, beating on things and doing, you know, I mean, I was a musician my whole life really. Mm -hmm. um, as mm -hmm. far as the photography that came really late. That actually was, um, that started more at Geographic. I mean, I I was hired there. Um, it's I don't know if I've ever told you this story. There there was a, we used to play. I was in a band that played in D.C. Um, pretty often, and we were I forget the name of the little club, but we played down the street from Geographic, and we had a big National Geographic following. And they would come in and sit, and I would talk to them, and and I just threw it out. I you know I had one young daughter at that point, and I was you know, just thinking about getting out of that business and settling down. <laughs> so, so I just asked him, you know, I said, what, you know, how hard would it be for me to get a job at National Geographic? And he says, well, what's your background? And I basically had none, you know, that, that would be 
compatible. Um, but he said, well, maybe, you know, maybe we can get you a, you know, like an entry level job if you're willing to do something like file pictures or that sort of thing. And I said, sure, that'd be fine. You know, I just want a job <laughs> that has like benefits, you know? Um, and so I went and I did an interview. I did three interviews actually. And I, I got hired totally on the basis that they liked me, I think, cause I really had no, no experience, no background. <laughs> <clears throat> and, um, other than the fact that I was willing to work hard, you know, but, um, so anyway, but, you know, they, I started off at entry level and then they put me through photography classes at National Geographic with their photographers. I don't know if you remember if they were still doing that when you were there or not, but um, you could take classes and <clears throat> we actually got a diploma and everything. <laughs> wow. No, no. So I, never, I had, never got a diploma. Yeah. So I, it was, um, you know, I, I think I did it for two years or three years um, where I went it's like every Thursday or something you would go into a class with, with one of the photographers, you know? And, um, and then that sort of got me prepared to be um, qualified more for doing picture editing. And that's how I got into the job I ultimately ended up with. And I stayed there for 18 years, but um, I guess the beauty of what you just asked me is that the, the way the two things go together is that by having that job, I didn't have to worry about playing commercial music that, other people wanted to hear mm -hmm. and I began writing my own little things that I you know just for myself and uh, I started playing them for a few people and um, uh, I think I can't remember who it was maybe it was, it was one of the one of my co-workers said well you know if you want to record that I'll, I'll pay for the <clears throat> you know I'll pay for the tapes and all that stuff and and so I did you know I had a I did a little cassette tape which I don't even know if you've seen that but it's no uh, I don't think so yeah, and that went, you know, that was just like sort of done within the National Geographic and then with my friends and family, you know, it wasn't a big deal. Um, but big enough that I gained a bigger following at National Geographic. And then the next project was Whispering Stones. Um, and I, I did that. And that the thing about Whispering Stones that was fascinating for me was that I, at that point, had not considered a career again in music. I'd considered myself already in the publishing business and picking the photo business. I'd sort of gotten my head out of the music career. But when Whispering Stones came out, I all of a sudden ended up with um, a record deal with Maggie's Music. <laughs> and, um, and then I started playing on all, all their artists' albums. And so it kind of ballooned basically from a small group of people at National Geographic that were willing to buy my tapes. And then when I did a CD, they were willing to buy the CD and then tell their friends and it got bigger and bigger. And pretty soon I, I had another career. <laughs> so um, I was doing, it was, it was nice. Geographic was great for me because I'd been there by the time the music got to the point where I could make a living off of it. I had been there long enough that I was getting six weeks of leave every year. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, at that point, just used all my leave to play. Um, and so I was doing both jobs, basically. And um, once my kids got out of high school, I just sort of said, you know, I guess I'll just go back to doing music. <laughs> that's, that's my whole life in a nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> and... We're done. No, uh, no, and it's. It, <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, yeah, we're here all week. Try the tofu. So, so let me let me ask you. It's funny because that's exactly the next question I was going to ask about that moment in time. I know that I did the same thing for a long time. I kept the day job and then did music full time, and then kept the day job and did writing full time. And you find yourself working 140 hours every day. So, mm -hmm. so when did you know was it was it that your daughter's graduated from high school and then you were like okay i can i can make this i can take this step what did it take for you to go you know what i'm ready to strike out and be a full-time artist and musician what did you do and, and and what were the steps to sort of disengaging yourself from the security of the day job that's a that is hard there were a number of different things i mean it was in that same time period where i ended up um getting divorced and then remarried and and of course Amy White is the person I ended up marrying and she's a musician as well and she had a day job <laughs> um 
so it, for a while there, we were both carpooling together, you know, and she worked not far from National Geographic and we would carpool together every day. And, and um, it got to the point where the different artists I was working with at Maggie's Music and then my own CDs were doing well enough that I looked at it and I went, you know, I could, I, I'm already doing this. I could just <laughs> take it one step further. Um, I was doing a lot of sideman work, backing up folk people at, at Wolf Trap and, and uh, you know, at the Birchmere, I was sort of a side man, you know, on call. They would just call me if, a, if someone came into town and they needed a backup guitar player. And so I was playing a lot and um, mostly just for other people. That's how I was making my money. But I figured that would be actually, you know, that would might be enough to sustain my current lifestyle since I wasn't having to support the kids anymore and, and they were off doing their thing. Um, and then with Amy, with her, <laughs> her full-time job, there was a little bit of a time where she was still working and I wasn't. So we had some money coming in mm -hmm. and that gave me that time period to work with getting Amy out of her musical closet. <laughs> and, and, um, she was pretty much where I had been before. She just, she enjoyed playing music, but she wasn't, she didn't really want to do it for a living or anything, but we ended up, uh, working on stuff together and then because of that it was i think it just gave us the confidence that you know we had enough people like you and other friends that were saying you guys are you know you're really good you know <laughs> <And so> <laughs> really good doesn't begin to cover it but yes we'll go with really good for now but you know what i mean it's kind of like mm -hmm. you, you get enough feedback that you want to um sort of pursue it while you still can while you're still young and um and for us it was just, I mean, we were in love, but we were in love musically as well as, you know, physically, emotionally. We were in love with each other's music. And so it was a natural thing. I had to, one of the worst things that happened to me musically, I was playing almost full time with Bonnie Rideout, a fiddle player that I really love. Mm -hmm. and, um, <clears throat> and we were doing a lot of just traveling around, just duo work. And then during the Christmas season, we had a, <clears throat> a show called A Scottish Christmas that was really popular because it was right on the right after river dance and all that so it was the next big thing and we we traveled all over the place and played all you know we played the kennedy center concert hall of all places we played everywhere and um <clears throat> that was like enough income just there for me you know but when amy and i started getting our stuff together i uh ended up having to quit that and that was a tough moment because it was it was uh, Bonnie and I had really built this really good uh, sort of musical relationship and also a, a big following. Mm -hmm. And I think it really hurt her feelings that I didn't, you know, I, I basically had to go and tell her and Tom Paxson and Debbie Smith and all the different people that I played with on a regular basis that I couldn't do it anymore. And, and the reason was I would go to a place like the Birchmere or to uh, um, Wolf Trap, the uh, barns you know and i would say look amy and i have a thing and we'd love to come and play do a concert and they go well that'd be great except we're already here with tom paxton and debbie smith and you know jonathan edwards and <clears throat> we just can't hire you you know and i i keep i kept trying to tell them, no but i'm just the backup guitar player i thought it's not like my show but it, it just i couldn't make the headway mm -hmm. when i was still backing up all these other people and so that was the biggest decision was having to say, okay, here's the leaping point. Amy and I are going to do a duo and everybody else is, you know, I have to tell everybody else no. And that was scarier than me going full time, I guess, from geographic to me playing music full time. The scarier thing was going from me playing music full time to playing with Amy as a different um, unit, you know? Mm -hmm. So there was a big crossover there. I had a lot of solo projects at that point. So I started sneaking her in on my solo projects. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> and they still, at that point, it was still the contract was under my name. So even though she played on, on Caledon Wood, for example, that album, and, and uh, Midsummer Moon, her name was just on the credits. She wasn't listed on the front cover. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I think the first time we, we decided to uh, to make that that big break was when we did um, um racing hearts you racing hearts thank you <laughs> yeah. 
getting <laughs> <No>. old now. <laughs> well, and I also, you know, that's one of my favorite albums by you. Of course, they're all my favorites, but but that one particularly I adore. And so I'm like, I remember very well Alan Amy's first duo album. That's not that's not hard for me to do at all. So so talk to me about that partnership. When, you know, I love what you said that you were in love, but you were also in love with each other's music. I was going to ask this later in the show, but why not ask it now? Talk to me about that collaboration. How do you two work together? What what about the partnership works so well? And how, how do you compose? How do you bring, does one of you write a tune and the other one adds to it? Or do you, do you really collaborate 50-50? How does all that come about? It's more the first thing. Um, one of us will come up with an idea and, um, if we if we have it in our mind that it's going to be a duo you know it it we mentally sort of imagine space for each other i guess that's an easy way to put it but amy's really shy still about playing and she's shy about doing anything but she's shy about playing in front of me she won't play in front of me and i hate it because i love listening to her play but um, i have to leave and go on a trip for her to feel comfortable to write music because she doesn't want me to have an ear on it and, and, and be critical. And, you know, I try not to be critical, but I'm sure that in her mind, she's thinking of, it's like an artist not wanting to show their painting to you until it's finished. You know, it's like, okay, yeah, it is going to be, that is going to be filled in, but that's, I'm not there yet. You know? And so we, we tend to work separately until it's at the point where we can collaborate and at that point, she may bring me in at that point and say, okay, here's my idea. I've got this cool thing here and here and here. What do you, I'd like to see what you would do with this. And, and she'll have something in her head about how she might hear it. But then at that point, we can be collaborative. And it goes both ways. I might write a tune on guitar and be thinking the whole time that, boy, this would be really beautiful with a mandolin harmony on top or with a harp or Amy plays everything. So I could imagine it with a drum <laughs> or with, you know, but, but I could, you know, for, so for, for me, it, it starts off probably as an idea on guitar and then evolves into this bigger thing with Amy. But um, in the last few years, we've been doing less collaborating. I've been doing more solo work and, and it's just because of the projects that have been offered to me. It's not as much, uh, um, I don't know. I don't know why. I guess it's just we we moved up to the mountains and just we're just enjoying being up here. <laughs> why would you leave? <laughs> I know. Yeah. And I want. I definitely want to talk about about the mountains. But but before we leave, Racing Hearts again, my favorite, oh, yeah, right. my one of my favorite albums. Um, th- that to me seems it's it's so funny because it seems like such a collaborative effort. Uh, specifically, I'm thinking of of two songs that you often play as a mashup, Mariposa and Desert Dance. Mm-hmm. They're separate tracks on the on the album, but when you I almost said the CD, but because I'm an I'm an old timer, but but on the album they're yes. separate tracks, but you often play them together. And yes. I, I would love to play a little bit of Desert Dance and mm-hmm. and let people hear it, especially that beginning, because Amy did some something that I think is so cool. And I, 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 <laughs> I, want, I want you to talk about, about what you did. Okay. So let's just play the last, maybe the, the first, like the first, like 30 seconds. And okay. then, and then I want to talk to you about that. So here, here okay. is the very first bit of Al Petaway and Amy White's desert dance off their album, racing hearts. And the reason I'm telling you, just so you know, exactly where you can find the song, because you're going to love it and you're going to need to go download it, buy it on iTunes or wherever it is you can buy it immediately after hearing it. So here's a little bit of Desert Dance. So now we're back. 
you heard just a little bit. And yep. I want to I want to talk about about that that thing that sounds like a a bird or a hawk. I, <laughs> if you would it, it's so cool because because the music is gorgeous and then there's this this ethereal sound rising above <laughs> it. And I want I want you to say what it is cuz it's so fabulous and also well, how did you get how did you get that, that that how did you get it to sound like it's in the middle of the Grand Canyon? That's the thing that I that I <laughs> want to know about really. It's so cool. Well, that you know, that song I I began writing that out in the desert, which is why it's called Desert Dance. I was in uh, Arizona and um the sun was going down and it just that first part just sort of came to me. It's almost like I'm improvising, but then Amy does this thing with her hands. She can play music with her hands where she blows across her thumbs and, and makes her hands into sort of a, a flute kind of thing. And she does that descending thing at the beginning. And, and what I did on the recording, oops, that was my iPhone falling out of my pocket. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I love technology works until it doesn't. <laughs> yeah, and then it, it hit the guitar on the way down. So oh no, I hope the guitar's uh, okay. So, yeah, it's, it's okay. I'm sure it'll be anyway. Um, so, so she made that sound like you you were saying, and it, and what I did is I put a uh, a reverb and I guess a reverb and a delay, and then just sort of let that tail of the thing just go and go, and and so that's all electronic, but it's it's so much fun. Um, this was back before we had uh, it was digitally recorded, but it was recorded. Um, back when we had ADAP machines, it was before wow. we could do it on a, a regular computer. And so all the every all the mixing on that album, all those little effects and stuff were mixed live. Wow. Um, not not when we recorded it, but when I did the mixing, I had a little mixing board and I had like the reverb on this thing and the, this over here. And Amy would help me. Okay, you bring that up while I bring this down, that kind of thing. Um, we didn't have that uh, the option of the, sort of the digital editing and the mixing. Um, so that was a an interesting album because we were really talk about being creative that was being pretty creative and uh, even there's a couple of tunes where um, we play piano and guitar together and those um, I discovered right off the bat that I couldn't EQ my guitar the same way I do when it's by itself because the frequencies would fight with the piano so I had a I learned a lot on that album that was all done at, in our home in Tacoma Park you know wow <laughs> you so know, so so let me ask you um this is a this is a tough question to ask someone who, to whom it this may come naturally but when you when you are when you are mixing a piece like 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 uh desert dance or mariposa or any or any of the other pieces that you that you mix yourself I, like i know you go to um I can't remember his name, but the, the amazing master guy, who's the amazing master guy, Wolf, somebody, what's his name? Oh, yeah. Billy Wolf. I'm not yeah. sure. Did he do that album? Uh, I guess he did. I can't I, remember. If, I believe I think Charlie. I, I don't know. It's hard. Yeah. It's, it's a long time ago. That might've been yeah. uh, one of our earlier um, people like air show or something. I don't remember. I, I, go I ahead. think, go I ahead think it was question. him, but, but, but the question, so, so it's not the mastering that I'm asking about. It's the, how do you decide how everything coalesces in a piece like that, that has all of these different layers, you know, like, like with desert dance, you have so many different layers that you're bringing in and, and so many different effects but yet they sound natural. I mean, they're not obviously because that, well, the whistle wasn't going to last forever on its own or whatever. So right. how, what goes through your mind when you're mixing a piece? Do you have, do you have an overall theme or an overall sort of plan or is it more organic than that? And how do you make that, those decisions as you go along? Yeah, I, I would say it kind of depends on how many instruments are involved. Um, I, Generally, it is more organic than that. Like that particular tune you're talking about. After the intro, all it is is us playing together. We, you know, we there's there are no other effects there mm -hmm. except maybe some reverb. You know, okay. So, so anything you hear is something we're actually playing. That's awesome. Um, and that's pretty true with all of our stuff. Although I, I'd like to just interject that some of the stuff where we have um, some of our later albums, we had guest artists come on and play. 
And that's where you have to get a little more creative. I had, a, for example, one of our albums, uh, we had a fiddle player come in who, who actually lives in New York, but he came in and he played four tracks of fiddle for this one tune. Mm-hmm. And we after he and then we paid him and he left and then we're listening back and we didn't like any of the four tracks very much you know oh. um, I mean that, not that we didn't like them I, just that they were all great they were just all not quite what we were looking for so right. what I did is I took all four tracks and I made a, a string quartet out of them and I mixed and matched all the parts and I created something that never actually happened wow and and that was that was so much that took me. I mean, a long time, but the end result was so much fun. And uh, he loved it. You know, we sent it to him before we put it on the record. We, we sent it to him and said, you know, here's what I did. I hope you're not offended, you know, and uh, he loved it. So that worked out really well. Um, and then there's other things like that. Like if, if I had a guitar player come in and do an electric guitar track on one of Amy's things, the same thing. He did one track that was sort of ambient, one track that was really sort of bluesy gritty and then another track that was just sort of rhythmic and and I used all three of them and then edited them all together so it sounded like um th- there were two guitars but different parts of his solos would pop in in different places than where he actually played them <laughs> <laughs> and and so what made you what made you decide that that like oh I'm going to bring this up in in the mix to to highlight this this version of the solo or this version of the solo what 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 are you listening for when you're doing that as i said like this idea of like for example when i when i um on my on my very first cd many many moons ago um I, I had, a, of all things, a country song, which is very funny because, you know, I don't write country music, but I went, okay, I'm going to write a country song. <laughs> and and I asked the the guy who was the engineer, who's also, uh, he's also a great guitarist. I asked him to do a kind of a, a, a country and Western electric guitar, slide guitar kind of thing. And I didn't even know what I, what I was right. looking for, but I, but I kind of knew. And he did it on one, in one take, and it was wonderful. And, and, and it went into the song. But I kind of knew what I was looking for. But I'm not you. You, you know so much more about music than I will yeah. ever learn. And so I was, I was wondering, like, what are you looking for? Like you said, you listened to the tracks and you went, no, this isn't really what we're looking for. But what were you looking for, and how do you know when you've got it? How do you know when you've gotten when you've when you've gotten a take that you love, or when someone else gives a take that you love? What what is it in a is it like jazz that it's in the pocket? What happens to you when you know it's right? Well, the, there there is that. I mean, even with my solo guitar playing, it's the same thing. I'm I'm looking for a certain feel, a certain um, you know, I, I'm more. I guess in, I'm unlike some guitar players I know that are all about getting everything technically perfect. I'm more interested in getting everything sort of more emotionally perfect and more feel perfect. And so I'll let a lot of things slide that may be considered mistakes like a squeaky note or a buzzy string or something. I'll let those go by, whereas some guitar players would never let those go by. But if it sounds and feels right, then I'll let that go. And the same thing if we have um, other artists coming in, and and Amy's Amy's really good. She's really good for me. She's like my producer, and then I'm kind of like her producer. And we we listen to things that we do, and we go, well, you know, I think if you did this, it might be better. Or like we had a something like what you did. Amy did a song that had sort of a country, maybe a country flavor, and so we had someone coming in and do a dobro part, and mm-hmm. we listened back to it and. Uh, there was this one note that just said, but to both Amy and I sounded like it was wrong. And it, it wasn't wrong, I mean, technically, but what I did, this is the magic of modern digital. I went in there and I just moved it up a half step or whole step or something. You know, I was able to solo out that one note, move it up to the note we liked, and it was perfect. And it was just sort of like, it's just what she, it, it, we, did, we never have an expectation really when we hire someone else to come in, we don't have an expectation. We accept, we know that we like what they do. Mm-hmm. We hire them because we like what they do and we want them to do what they do. And I think the worst thing is when they come in and they don't do what they do, they, they do what they think you want them to do or something. It's like a weird psycho- psychology. And so um, I don't 
you know, I don't like as much working with a lot of people like that as some people do. I, I think I like playing live with them almost better because in the studio, everybody's feeling a little bit pressured. You know, it's like, okay, I'm here. I'm here for a certain number of hours. I got to give you something you want. And then, you know, <laughs> I've always felt a little uncomfortable with that situation, but you know, that's why it's nice having your home studio. So you can just, when you feel like it, you can come down. I did a couple of my solo albums I did in two days, you know, just came down. It was a good feeling. I just recorded the whole album and edited it and then sent it off, you know? Wow. But, um, but with Amy's stuff, it's a lot different because we'll have, her, she'll do several vocal tracks, you know, and then we'll mix and match those. And, and I'll do several guitar solos. And then, she, you know, I'll have one that I really like, but then she'll say, no, I don't want it that busy. And so we'll go back and we'll do a simpler version or I'll find one that's better, you know? And so with us working together, it takes a lot longer because we have to make each other happy, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and, and that's the same with when we have outside artists come in, we have to make them happy and we have to make ourselves happy. And so it's all, you know, it's all a balancing act, I guess. And then you've got the final product and you, you listen back to it and you go, oh, maybe we should have done this, you know? Ah. <laughs> so, so you're, I don't know if you're ever totally satisfied. And that's probably why you keep trying over and over and doing more albums. You know, you just like, okay, well maybe we can get better, you know? But um, I, I actually go back to, every once in a while, I'll go back and listen to one of my older CDs and, and I'll listen to it and I go, Hey, you know, it was really much better than it is in my memory, you know, because um, you a lot of times don't listen to it after you finished with it. And all you remember is all the stuff that went into working on it. You don't remember how it ended up feeling or sounding, you know, and I, I like doing that. I like going back, listening to Whispering Stones, for example, uh. listening to that and going, wow, that's so nice. You know, I mean, just sitting in the studio playing guitar. That was back before editing, too. Um. <laughs> uh, and 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 it is again i i could say it's one of my favorite uh, al petaway albums but there i love i there are there are things about all of them that are my favorite so it's very hard to if somebody were to sit me down and and say you must choose a favorite i would have a very hard time but but listening i want to mm -hmm. i want to play a little bit of um we could do either dry a dance or spin drift but i i think let's let's play a little because i love both so much but let's let's play a little bit of spindrift and i want to talk to you about that yeah. that idea of of what spindrift is and how you brought it to uh, to music because I, that's that's kind of what i feel mm -hmm. like you did so let's listen for just a sec to the first little bit of mm -hmm. al petaway's spindrift on whispering stones here it is Okay. So A it's gorgeous, right? And and <laughs> it's I mean that that Thank that you. goes that goes without saying really, but I'm going to say it anyway. But but let, I'd love to talk a little bit about about what what first of all what is spindrift and second of all how cuz I think you got it across. That's the thing. That's the that's the beauty of your music is that it it's 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 musical pictures to me. It always evokes 
sort of a different time, a different place. It, it makes me see the images rather than just hearing them when I listen to your music. So talk a little bit, if you would, about what Spindrift is, it's the, 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 the stuff itself, and also yeah, yeah. how it relates to the song you wrote. Well, that was an interesting time period. Spindrift, you know, is, a, uh, is basically the, the foam that washes up onto a beach when it's really windy and it kind of settles and bubbles and then kind of goes back. And, and so that was the original sort of inspiration for that, that's, that title. Um, but, you know, it's funny because I re-recorded that tune a couple of different times. And, and after I moved to the mountains, it, it, it became a different image for me. Um, there's, when you live in the mountains and it rains, what, what happens afterwards is all these like wisps of steam and mist come up through the mountains and they kind of spin and drift through the valleys and, Ooh. and it started becoming that for me, even though it doesn't mean, the word doesn't mean that, but the, the, I just watched the, the clouds, the little mist come up through the valleys and they'll just, they'll make these little, uh, um, spirals, you know, and they, it's just beautiful. But, um. So that became a different meaning for me after I moved here. Um, the tune itself it has an interesting sort of history physically. Um, I had been playing a lot of bluegrass and swing and really playing hard. And I kind of injured my left, I guess in my left elbow. I did some damage to one of the tendons. And it wasn't tendonitis, but it was more like tennis elbow, I guess. Mm. But, uh, and so I went to the doctor and they said, you were going to have, they said, you're going to have to kind of lay back and don't play guitar for a while. And I, I thought, well, that's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, I found, basically I found a new tuning um, in that tune. Um, it's, it's the tuning is D A D G A D and it's become my standard tuning now, but I, so I put it in that tuning and put a capo on the fifth fret of the guitar and that made it, much easier for me to push down the strings and to play mm -hmm. and uh, that particular tune only uses the first uh, the first four or five frets on the from the capo and so my hand didn't have to move at all to play it um, and the, the the notes you hear are shared between the left and the right hand so neither hand is moving too fast even though it sounds like they are <laughs> um, so it's kind of a magic trick in a sense uh, which i'm sure you're familiar with but um <laughs> It's like, it's one of these things where when I play it, I do that intro and I hear, I almost always hear somebody in the audience or, or several people go, oh, like that. And it's, it's, to me, it's, it's, um, it is, it's like, like pulling the bunny out of the hat. It's like this thing where you're, um, what I'm doing is, is extremely easy at least for me. I was going to say, <laughs> <laughs> let's qualify but, but even, that. <laughs> but, but if you figure I'm using mostly two fingers and only using two frets for that entire tune, that, that's sort of what I mean. It was easy physically on me. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so that opened up a whole new, whole new future for my guitar playing really. Cause I hadn't done much like that before. And I was at the time kind of into the, the starting to get into more of the Celtic sound and um, that had that, that, that snuck into that. And um, I went to one night at the Birchmere, John Renborn was coming in to play with Bert Yanch and they were, they were there. Wow. Um, and their, their guitars didn't make it. So <laughs> <laughs> I got a call from the Birchmere um, and to, to bring down a couple of guitars. And so also, Mary Chapin Carpenter brought down a guitar, and so we we gave them a selection of guitars that. Uh, whoops! What are you doing? <laughs> That's my dog. She just got sick in the background for some reason. Anyway, so we we had a couple of guitars um, that we brought to them, and John Ranborn loved my guitar, and he played it through the whole show, and then afterwards we were hanging out in the in the. Uh, green room a little bit he said well if you have a guitar like this you must be a fairly decent guitar player and i said well you know i've been i've been writing these little ditties at home and all that you know i hadn't at that point i hadn't recorded any of it and um so he said well play me something and i played him spin drift mm -hmm. and and he went um he, he just went over the top he was like that he says play me some more <laughs> play me some more <laughs> but he said you know you you really he said you really need to record this stuff and at that moment, it was a, 
oh, what was his name? He was a guy you worked with, uh, the English guy that worked at Geographic that had the recording studio. Richard uh, Richard uh, Easby. Richard Easby was there. And yeah. he said, well, I'll front you the recording. I'll front you the recording time for you to do this album. And so that's how I figured that's the key part of my whole career right there was that, oh, John Renborn likes my music. That is, to me, that was huge. And then also the fact that this guy that has a part ownership in a recording studio is going to let me do it for free. <laughs> um, Can't beat I mean, that. I had to, yeah, I mean, it, it all came with a recording contract and everything, which eventually got sold out to Maggie's Music. So it wasn't, mm -hmm. it wasn't like just for free, but it was, um, but anyway, it was, um, it was one of those things that that tune is still, not only is it still an audience favorite, but it's still one of my favorites to play. I, I open almost every one of my solo shows with that um, because it's like sort of an introduction. You know, it's, it's sort of like you start with that slow, pretty thing and then it goes into this fast section and then it comes back to the slow, pretty thing. And at the end of that, I could do just about anything and people think I'm good. So. <laughs> well, um, you know, you, you are good. So let's, <laughs> let's not... Let's not uh, let's not debate that. But but it's interesting though this this idea of you know Spindrift and and the history of it. You 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 wrote it. You were I don't know. I the question that I want to ask is is a tough one because when we when we talk about this idea of being a creative soul, because I think that's what you are ultimately. I find you one of the most creative beings I've ever met. And I think wow. because of that. Likewise. No, <laughs> oh, oh, thank you. That's very sweet. Thank you. Uh, but I, I think you see the world differently, you know, and, and when you look at something like the way the, the sea foam hits the sand, that sparks a melody in you, right? There's some kind of transference or something that happens in the creative mind, in your creative mind that lets you get inspired by, and I, and I want to ask you what your inspirations are, but specifically, like, I'm going to write this, I, I'm starting to write a song. And this, what the image that that came to me is an image of, of the sea foam. But now it's about the spirals of, of the mist, in, <laughs> you know, so, so, how does how do you glean the how do, how does music come out of of the spindrift or the spirals that are made of the mountains or the the imagined dryad which is a, a woodland a woodland nymph dancing mm -hmm. you know how I, well i would say i know you know what it is but <laughs> but, but for somebody who might not know right no that's good but but you know what what how does how does melody get sparked inside you from what inspires you? I know that's a big question, but I'd love to know if you have thoughts on that. What is it? You know, that is a good question. And there, there are two sides to that question. One, one, <laughs> one of them is that the, the, a lot of times the music comes first and then it suggests an image mm -hmm. and that'll become the title. And then other times, like the whole Waters in the Wild album was all, I went to, I went physically went to places around the Chesapeake Bay and I did photography of the, the area and then wrote music based on my feelings at that time, how I felt. And so that was totally inspired by water and by the places I was visiting. Um, and, and that, so, I mean, a lot of times I, I it is that the title comes from an exact, you know, like broken mist is one of my favorite tunes I've ever uh, oh, I love that tune. Mm -hmm. Out of that, yeah, and mm -hmm. that may not have been on Waters in the Wild. I think it was. It is. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Maybe not. It is. <laughs> anyway, track so three. Broken Mist, <laughs> yeah, Broken Mist is one that I've re-recorded too. Uh -huh. And again, that one was I was sitting. I was. I used to go down and photograph the Chincoteague ponies every year. You know, in the spring, mm -hmm. and I'd go out there early in the morning because once once the sun came up, the mosquitoes were so bad that you couldn't stay there. So. Um, I got up really early one morning and the mist was all over the, the, the swampy wetlands and I, the sun was coming up and these deer started walking 
out and the mist just kind of broke open. And I got a, a, a photograph of that that is still one of my favorite photos. It won a, an award at National Geographic, actually. It was kind of a golden image of these deer in the mist. Mm -hmm. And um, so that, that was the inspiration for that tune. And it's just the way I felt at the time. Then moving to the mountains, the, uh, like I said, Spindrift did that thing to my brain. And now Broken Mist has a similar feeling here because mm -hmm. there's a lot of mist up here. We have, you know, these misty mountains and then you'll hear, you'll see like a Amy Hazard critter cams all over the place and you'll see the bear coming through the mist, you know, and it's just, it's a different feeling now that we're not near water. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, but yeah, that definitely I have a nature uh, I guess influence is what you would call it. I, I feel like my best tunes have all been written when I've been really conscious of my surroundings in, in a, you know, it might not even have to have a guitar in my hand. I could just be out taking a walk in the woods and, uh, and just feeling how it feels to be in the, in the, in the woods at that time and then come back and a tune will come out of it. You know, it's not a conscious thing like, oh, I'm going to go write a song about trees. That's not what it is. It's more like you set yourself up for that creative spirit to work. And uh, in my case, I think nature is the, one of the best in, in inspirations. I guess does that make sense? <laughs> oh, it it absolutely does. It absolutely does. It it's interesting. My the way my brain works, I'm always trying to look for. Um, a, a concrete, practical answer to what is essentially sort of a, a, a an ephemeral, emotional, spiritual question. <laughs> you know, so so I'm trying to quantify something yeah. that that may not be quantifiable. But um, but before we leave your before we leave your your music, um, as far as I want to play one more song, if that's okay. Um, uh, one yeah. of my, another one of my favorites of yours and Amy's is Sundog and. And I would love oh, yeah. to play a little bit of that. And also if you could share why you called it Sundog and what you wrote it for, because I was there and that made me so delighted, but, mm -hmm. but I would love it if you yep. would share what that is. So let's take a listen to the very beginning and what's, what's, uh, oh, so, so, you know, on this tune, um, Amy plays piano as, as well as Al playing guitar. And it is, it is, to me, one of the beauties of, of your partnership is, is that you work so beautifully together and you build on each other's um, sort of creative inspiration and ideas and it really feels that way in this song so let's let's uh let's listen to the tune for a little bit and here it is this is sundog and it's off uh al petaway's caledon wood but it is al petaway and amy white here we go so much okay i'm sorry i actually i'm not gonna apologize i love this tune so much there we go so, 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 well, i'm glad <laughs> go ahead that that's one of my favorite tunes too actually and we still play that whenever we have a piano uh, at, a, at a concert um we we don't have it in our contract anymore because it makes it too difficult but amy likes to play on a a nice acoustic piano, a grand piano. Mm -hmm. So we don't always play those songs, but when we do, um, 
that's one of the ones we play and I love it. I mean, that's like one of those things that I can just get into. And that was probably one of the most collaborative tunes we ever wrote. And uh, it was written right after we got married, which uh, you were, you were there. And um, we, you know, we were outside in the big circle and everything. And it was kind of a, it wasn't a, it was a beautiful day, but it wasn't like a real sunny day, but it was, you know, had, but there was a sun dog that appeared. Um, and this was right after I think one of the Osprey flew around the circle. It was like all of these different images. Are you, you want to come in, Amy? No. Come in and say hi. She's not, uh, we're not on video. No, we're not on video. No. Please, <laughs> please say hello. Hi, Amy. And this is good timing because we're, <laughs> we're talking about sun dogs. So this oh, is good time. Watch out. Oh boy, what a mess. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> yeah. Amy, Amy almost stepped in the dog vomit. That was oh, no. <laughs> good, good image for the song. No, no, so we were, you know, we were, all our friends were in a circle. We, you know, we had body. She was there. I, I was there, yeah. yes. We had Bonnie Rideout play fiddle, and then of course Eric Riggler came from California and played the Illin pipes. And nice it was you. a to me, it was one of the most magical days ever. And um, I'm glad. And when, <laughs> and when we came, <laughs> when we came back from all of that excitement, um, we wrote this tune. And I, you know, I I think it came. It was sort of what I was talking about earlier where I had an idea and then she had an idea. But in this case, I think it was more collaborative than any of our other ones. Cause it wasn't like I came to her with almost a complete song mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. she added her parts or vice versa. It was more like we, we, I mean, I don't remember how we wrote it, but it, when we play it, it feels like it's a, a conversation, you know, it feels like we're going back and forth, you know, on the, on the tune. So it, it's, to me, it feels way more collaborative than some of the other ones, but, um, what do you think about that? Amy? I don't know. You don't know, but it's uh, your piano on that is just, I mean, that tune, I could play it without the piano and she could play it without the guitar, but it just wouldn't be the same. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I agree but, to, together. It's, it's something that is sort of the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. You know, there's something very magical about, about listening to it. And so I'm glad, I'm so grateful that you uh, let me, play it on on the show a little bit so let let let's talk about this uh, you were mentioning and amy you're here so i'm hoping you'll be willing to chat a little bit about the critter cams because i know you both love wild <laughs> on the mountain and what what are the critter cams if you would just give a little bit of a, of a peek into what that is and and what made you what fascinates you about all right <laughs> well yeah alan are gonna switch real quick um so I can get closer to the mic. Um, what they are, they're like potato chips. You can't have <laughs> just one. <laughs> That's what I discovered a long time ago. I realize I've been doing this for at least eight years now. Wow. Um, and it's a friend of ours, Sally Sparks, had a relative who worked at a trail camera shop or a shop that actually produced those among other items for hunters and things and um she just told me about the camera and and i thought i'd try one and oh my gosh it was just so exciting to see what's actually out there you have no idea oh i do <laughs> because have, i watch them i watch a critter yeah, yeah. cast <laughs> <laughs> but you know what i mean it's like I do. you think you know your own yard and you don't um i mean i wouldn't have had as much fun doing this in tacoma park obviously because al and i often say we prefer the wildlife here than to what we had in tacoma park agreed um, agreed yeah <laughs> um but what they're basically motion sensor activated cameras that can record photo or video and with audio mm -hmm. um and they've slowly improved i mean they're not perfect they're not like real 4k even the ones that say they are it's all interpolated and a little pixelated but it, i don't care it's just the fact that it's documenting something that i wouldn't have seen otherwise and you really you get a chance to learn the personalities of the different animals you start becoming fond of particular characters and you you know it's like there was for a while we had a fox that had two tails like a little tip of two tails and i always wondered what happened to him and the orphan yeah, bobcat see, that would be a good song title the fox with two tails <laughs> <laughs> it, <laughs> yeah, it would 
things well, the, like to, that. To me, the, the most fun ones are all the bears. The, uh, you know, we've got every spring we have a mama and cubs, different ones every year that mm -hmm. show up in the little tiny babies. And, and oh. I've, they've, they've inspired several of my tunes. And <laughs> they're, um, it's so much fun to watch them because they, you know, we get to see them the way on these cameras that no one else sees because they, they're they relaxed. And so we'll see, we have one video Amy posted recently of the uh, mama bear playing with the cubs on our hammock, and tearing it to pieces. <laughs> but um, it's it's amazing to see a mother being sweet and gentle with her cubs and playing just like a mother human being would, you know, it's amazing. Well, so since we got here, we only have eight acres, but since we got here, I just wanted to be able to enjoy more of that land because otherwise it's kind of inaccessible because of all of the wild berries mm -hmm. and uh, just the fallen logs, which all the critters love to walk on top of, but it's a little harder for humans, you know, so we decided to cut in trails. So as we cut in more trails, I put out more cameras and the wildlife absolutely appreciates the trails as much or perhaps more than we do <laughs> and um you know in fact i'll be posting soon a video of the bears just running as fast as they can and it looks like they're doing it for fun yeah there's and, two, two young bears and they look like they may have been from the same you know litter at some yeah. point but they're just chasing each other up and down the trails at top speed it's, it's really just funny. amazing yeah, and you yeah, don't try to outrun a bear. That's what my video is <laughs> called because I think they can go thirty-five miles per hour. Um, they can go really fast. Yeah, so, yeah. So especially if you're on a path with no trees in the way. <laughs> Are these all black bears? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank goodness. Yeah, I wouldn't be quite as cavalier about walking around. Um, in the woods if we were in grizzly territory <laughs> yeah well or even brown bear territory they're they're not that much smaller than grizzly right. oh yeah yeah I, yeah exactly that's that's so cool uh, well so since i have you both here for just a moment i know that you both take amazing photographs of of just even just your view from from the i mean i well i'm just always i'm like hounding your instagram feed and seeing all the different photos you take what what do you both look for in a photograph? How do you how do you prep to take it, and what inspires you to to take the shot? You know what what makes a photograph a great one to you? Is it the emotion or spirit of the image, or is it more technical than that? Like, it's the for me, it's the time. It's not the technical. It's the time. It is the moment, and it's almost always the light. So mm -hmm. there's very little preparation involved. It's catching the light when it's magic. Mm -hmm. And then, and then for the scenic pictures, like That's we I post. Mean, well, I mean, but yeah. you know, even even your bear, we we have bear photos we've taken with our own cameras too. Mm -hmm. Those are like things you can't plan. You just have to have a camera ready to go. But um, with the scenic stuff, same thing. We have cameras sitting out, ready to go, because something will happen out on the mountains, like the mist I was talking about, or. Mm -hmm the sun will come through the trees and make these beautiful you know rays. rays of light and then then you'll see something else coming over the top of the ridge and and it's just you know the combination of all those things sometimes happens in less than a minute and then it's gone for right? less than even yeah. two or three seconds Cause, you cause can I, lose the prime light you know early in the morning things like that will happen and amy's constantly getting irritated with me for not getting her up to go see it and I'm, and I'm telling her no it will by the time I would have gone to get you and come back it would have been gone and that's right. what happens you know right. like yeah yeah sure <laughs> You know, and it's funny, totally on the other end of the spectrum here in, in Brooklyn, New York, I, I'm out on my balcony every morning at dawn taking pictures of, of the sunrise. And, Aww. you know, there are definitely buildings in the way, but I've, but the clouds are incredible. The light can sometimes, it does the same thing to me. And I'm, and I'm out there taking pictures and Rich, of course, is asleep dead to the world since he's such a night owl, but I'll come <laughs> I'll come back in and I'll be dancing around that I got a, a you know a nice picture of the dawn and he's like Aww. yeah this would be different if we lived in the forest and then he just goes back to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> it's well, it's true it, it, it would be different but that's okay. I mean you know I think I think to me 
what's fascinating about capturing the moment, you know, and highlighting it, whatever it is, is that it will never happen that same way again. And now it's almost like it's proof of the magic, you know, it's, it's proof. Yeah. That mm-hmm. there. And I, and I well, love that. Oh, and, and I would think that's all the more important, especially now. Well, it's true in, in a place like New York too, though, because the architecture and the different, the different things are different that you're looking at. But again, those moments of light and, or, or, uh, you know, some sort of activity that, that just, they just go by so fast. It is, it's almost like you're, you feel lucky that you were there when that happened, when that light hit that one little corbel or whatever it is. And, and I don't know, I, I uh, feel that way here. Even, even a, a path that we walk on every day, mm-hmm. sometimes there'll be like a little piece of moss lit up by just one ray of sun coming through. And it, it may never do that again, you know? Right. And, so. and it's that, 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 temporary nature of it that I've always found so fascinating about photography is because it, it probably won't it not certainly not in the same way and yet you can have the image forever if you if you're lucky enough well, yeah. to be and there you, and you, <laughs> right right well, and you know that what we do is we take um we don't usually take just one image something will attract us and we'll take 20 images of that thing or that scene and then even then there's only going to be one, if that, mm-hmm. that, that is worth posting on Facebook or something. You know well, and I, mean? I still remember that beautiful misty tree that you, you took a wonderful photo of that tree yeah. in the clouds. It was like in the mist. It was, um, you know, it was when you lived in Maryland. I can't remember where you were. Oh, believe it or not, that was right outside Goddard Space Flight Center. You're, yeah, uh, you're yeah. Right. It, was, it was in the middle of... Uh, yeah, I the, love the, that. Yeah, I, I haven't even thought about that picture in years wow i'm gonna have to go back and find it now my goodness <laughs> yes, you, are. <laughs> you know and you know what's really funny about about that is that those kinds of images and i love for you to talk about that if you could a little in in that particular photograph and and maybe i'll i'll i'll, I'll be bold and post that photo in the show notes if i if i can find it um you know the first thing you see is the cattails of that image and then if you look more then you see the trees almost pop out they almost come out of the mist at you when you're taking photographs do those kinds of layers happen for you too what what you know what happens to you when you're seeing it and taking pictures of the many layers or the many facets of whatever it is you're seeing do you get surprised by them and if so how well the time that i usually get surprised is if I'm doing more of the after effects work, like working in Photoshop and adjusting. Mm-hmm. Um, that is, you know, sometimes I'm surprised at the effect that some things can have, like when you're removing too much of a certain color. Cause you know, it, it can be just a, a very small fraction of a movement that you make with your camera that can actually change the hue of the light, even though the scene hasn't changed. And so Mm -hmm. sometimes you'll want to color correct or, and it can change things dramatically, the, 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 even the contrast and the detail. So that kind of thing can surprise me. But I I also think what you were talking about with the layers um, at the time, I I agree. There's, there's sometimes where you'll, you'll see that, the sun coming through the uh, the cattails in the foreground that's what you're kind of focused on but then when you when you kind of focus on the next layer out behind it you go oh well that's really cool too and then you go and and try to decide sometimes you have to take all of those and then later go back and decide which one is best yeah well like hdr is all the rage and and it's amazing because in some ways that is what we see that's how we see and we wish we could put it all into one photograph which is why it's such a popular tool now but um there are times when I, i'm just more of a bokeh person <laughs> you know more of a <laughs> short you know real short depth of field i really love just the fuzzy dreamy mm-hmm. uh, aspect of things and just and so I do a lot of like flower photography. I love just having part of it in focus. So what I love about the the close up photography is that at least when I've done it, but also when she's done the ones I've seen at hers, when I'm photographing, for example, the really close in on a flower, mm-hmm. I'm looking at the light, I'm looking at the flower and all this stuff. Later I'll go look at the pictures and I'll see these 
insects in there that I didn't see before. Right. And they'll be like right there in front of me, but I wasn't looking at them. You know, there's always something else, another layer of, mm -hmm. of, of seeing, you know. That well, you and I like to. You, you took the photo of the tree stump, an old tree oh, stump yeah. with a hole in it. And we're thinking, oh, it looks like a little fairy house, like the door to a fairy house. And when he put it on his iPad and he was just adjusting for the darkness, all of a sudden he saw what looked like a little face peering through. Right. I mean, it wasn't, but it kind of looked like Well, yeah, that. it did. It looked like a little, <laughs> like a little sprite or something. And then, and then if you backed off and you looked at the whole picture, the, the, the stump with the hole in it looked like an old man's face with a big eye and a lip. And, you know, it was like you could, you know, you could look at all these different layers and see faces. That's another thing that's fascinating about taking pictures of forests or, you know, your brain is geared to see faces. So we are constantly seeing faces in our and, pictures. And you know what? I just thought I'd mention that this whole time Al has been talking with his hands, he's been emoting with yeah, his hands I do that. Yeah. and this you know just for your benefit <laughs> <laughs> that's not surprising i talk with my hands too all the time it's true <laughs> and it's it's actually really bad i was doing uh i was doing a show and I was talking with my hands and I had a, a sign language interpreter and what I was told was to stop talking with my hands because people who were deaf did oh, yeah. not know who to pay attention to. And I'm like, I am so <laughs> sorry. I had no idea. <laughs> you know, to me, I'm just talking regularly, but no, for, for people who are deaf. Oh, that's hilarious. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> so it was, it was an object lesson for me about, about uh, knowing what I was doing and being mindful of that because I, I'm, I'm the same way. It's like I talk screaming in an audience. Yes. It's screaming unintelligible <laughs> words in an audience while people are trying to enjoy a performance. Yes. yes. Yeah. It's <laughs> there. Yeah. So I, I had to learn how not to do that. If I were, if I'm going to have a sign language interpreter, interpreter, then I cannot talk with my hands and it's, and it's hard for me because I'm very used to it. So well, and I, th I think it's part of, it's part of expressing yourself, which you can't see what I'm doing. But, <laughs> He's doing but you know what, again. <laughs> but I could feel with, with, with how you said expressing yourself that your hands went right. all over the place when you said That's it. Right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and now Andrew. I'm sitting here not. Now I'm sitting here trying not to do it because of what Amy said. Uh, <laughs> sorry, no, 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 no. That's. Oh, never mind. I was just thinking because uh, on the other, the flip side, Al's friend, um, what's what's his name? The sound engineer who's I blind. Don't know. I have one friend. Greg. Greg. Oh, Greg. Greg, oh, Greg, Greg Lucas. Blind, yeah. yeah, you know Greg, right? Greg Lucas. Um. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, he's fine, but but I bet you he could have told you that without without seeing him, because he can't, he would have been able to tell you that Al was moving his hands while he was speaking. Because I mean, that's the kind of thing he can hear. Right, right. <laughs> he's know? got the he's got the good ears for that sort of thing. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah, I I can't not talk with my hands, and it's it's actually really funny. The same thing happens with singing. When I'm on stage singing, it's much easier for me to sing when I'm not holding a guitar because then I can move. Mm. But when I'm holding oh, a guitar, I have to sort of stand still and play and sing. And I'm, you know, I'm one of those people. I, I accompany myself on the yeah. guitar to sing. I don't, I'm not a guitarist. You know what I mean? So, so it's, mm -hmm. it's interesting that the movement is so uh, integral to what I do. So I want to, I want to ask you when you're, when you're performing, um, what is, what is going on with you physically? Are you in tune with that kind of thing? Or are you just, the music is what's sort of coming through and that's all that you're paying attention to? I wish it was just that. <laughs> I, think one thing, we, I think we're different in that way. Cause Amy, Amy is a much more physical person than I am in that respect. I, I've always felt sort of uncomfortable in front of a crowd um, if I don't have a guitar. <laughs> That's mm. me. I hate, no, I know, but I mean, I you can, but you can play the drum and dance, and it, you know, it's great. You know, yeah, but but I, I couldn't. Saying. If I play the drum, I don't move that much. I'm not much of a dancer, really. I, I am more of a. I like to close my eyes and just immerse myself into what I'm doing and try to block out everything else, which is not really necessarily the best thing to do as an entertainer, but it, it makes me get into the music better. And I, if I don't do that, I tend to see things in the audience or 
I tend to concentrate on my mistakes or I do things that I, I feel like aren't really helping me. And, and I think I do my best playing when I just kind of go away. <laughs> well, in that respect, I think neither of us really feel like we are entertainers so much as people who write music and right. we perform in front of people sometimes, you know, it's right. not, we're not like, we don't, I don't know. We don't have like a shtick or whatever. We don't. So. <laughs> I, you know, and it's funny that you say that because uh, watching you perform is, uh, it's a sheer, it's sheer delight. And here's why. The reason I love watching you perform is because you're, I know this word is bandied about a lot nowadays, but it's true for you too. You're authentic. You're, you're who you Aww. are up on stage. <laughs> No, it's, I mean, I always feel like you're, like I am, I mean, I, 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 I'm, your, I'm your friend and I know that I'm your friend, but I always feel like you have invited me into your house, where no matter the size of the venue, like you've invited me into your house and we're just going to have, we're just going to hear some really great music and it's not going to be, it's not going to be, uh, you know, you're not going to have lasers in your show or whatever, but, it, but, it's, <laughs> but it's very, you know, but it's very, it's intimate and it's, and it's like we're all friends and there's something so powerful about that, that you both bring to, and I, you know how many times I've seen you perform, it's yeah. endless, right? But you bring that and I think that's so it's so special for anyone who's ever heard you. Well, we're so lucky people want to come and listen. Well, you know, and actually come into the living room. But with no, us. I, I think I think you're. You know, one of one of my favorite compliments I ever got was someone saying something to that effect. You know, that uh, they were maybe they were introducing us to somebody. I don't remember, but they were saying, and they're just like this in real life. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I thought. I thought that was a neat uh, thing to think about because I, I know I've played with musicians that have a show and they go on and, and they tour all over the place. They do the same show every night, mm -hmm. you know, and it's really effective. And then, um, but it, like, I, I just can't do that, you know? <laughs> right. I, 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 we end up sometimes having the same introductions to some of our tunes because that's well, what inspired are. the tune. But, <laughs> But I, I, I feel like, um, like, I do feel like when I go on stage, I'm more nervous in a sense than I might be sitting in my home by myself. But, but I'm, I really don't feel like I'm any different, put it that way. I feel like I'm, this is, this is what you get, is what you're seeing, you know, what you're hearing and seeing, that's me. Oh, and, in and this I'm, instance, I wish we did have a camera so you could see Chloe. Yeah, because well, she just came up. And, we can do that at the end. Maybe. Yeah, right. At, at the end, at the end, we can. I absolutely. Except no, I'll have to leave first. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> that's fair. I understand. Um, <laughs> yeah. No. See, and that's th that that idea of being authentic, being who you are. Uh, that that brings that that invites people like me into your music. You know that I think is so. It's so important because there's. I, you well, know, you I, know. It, it, go ahead. No, no, just saying. It's almost become a cliche with when people um, that are successful in any particular art, you know, that they they say, "Well, how did you get so successful?" And their their advice is always to be yourself. You know, <laughs> um, don't try to be someone else. And and I guess naturally, I've always sort of felt that way you know and um i've been lucky but but it's I, I think a lot of people are always trying to be their favorite artist whoever that is you know mm -hmm. and um if you're authentic no matter what your art is if you're authentic and you just this is me a lot of times you you go further i mean people can like you said you can sense that you can sense that we're not faking it this is just us you know right and it's and it's that way with the music too. And something you said to me, Al, uh, twenty years ago now, something like mm -hmm. I mean, a while. Um, yeah. You said something. I was I was bumming out. I was bumming out about my music, and you said the words, "Keep playing your music, and you'll find your audience." Mm. And and I went 
okay. <laughs> and I did, which is great. Yeah. But, but Those let me people ask. people in the subway are so nice. Too. I know. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Uh, <laughs> no, it's, you know, I get dollars even sometimes. No, but <laughs> so, so, so tell me, does that still hold true for you? Do you still believe those words? Um, I think so. I, I think um, those words and also I, I do feel like there's a, an element of being liked that comes into play. Mm -hmm. I, tell, I tell people that, you know, like I, like I said to you, I tell people that they should do what they love, do what, what speaks to them. But the other 50% of that is to be really nice. And, and to everyone you deal with, because mm -hmm. if you want a career in something, you want people to hire you back. And uh, I feel like you have to be, you know, just you have to make people want to have you back, I guess. Right. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Com no, I, I agree completely that this idea of what I say to my clients when I do life coaching or even my students, I, I always say be incredibly easy to work with. That's right. that's one of yep. the one of the best things you can do as far as any artistic endeavor, or, is, or any any you know, endeavor really. Yeah, it doesn't even have to be any artistic. Yeah, endeavor. that's 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 true. That's true. But but if you're working, you know, if you're doing a creative collaboration with someone, it it is so you know like we you and I were talking about uh, Al about how you and Amy work together and this idea of bringing the music to each other, and then. You know, if you're working with another musician, the same kind of thing has to happen. You have, you, you're going to have to work together. And so like you're, you've worked, you know, with Tom Paxton, Cheryl Wheeler, David Wilcox, mm -hmm. Amy White. You've worked with all these amazing musicians. How does that work? You know, what makes the creative collaboration work? Is it, is it just, okay, we each know our music. We, we each have musical chops and we're both nice. Or is there something else that happens that makes a collaboration, a creative collaboration specifically really shine? Well, I, I do think you have to have a lot of mutual respect. I think mm -hmm. it, with what you're doing. Um, I, I, I this the first time I ever played with Cheryl Wheeler. You mentioned her. Um, I was really nervous about it. It was a studio thing. We were recording an album, and uh, and she was she's got kind of a tough exterior, you know. And she's a sweetheart, but she, mm -hmm. you know, Jonathan Edwards was producing the thing, and and he said, "Here's this is Al, this is Cheryl," and she said, "Okay, what? This is the tune I want you to play. Let me see what you got." You know that kind of a attitude. Yikes. And so, yeah, we started playing and I played a few licks and I went into this little pretty thing like spin drift style and, and she just stopped playing and she was in tears and she looked at me and, and she looked up to me and said, will you marry me? <laughs> and she's gay. So that's, that's a big compliment. <laughs> but, um, so that was really, I think that kind of communication really goes a long way when you're playing with someone. But, um, it, I like to, I guess I've never been a real, musically never been a real strong ego in the sense that if someone asked me to play guitar with them, what I want to do is play a support role. And, and uh, I feel like I'm, I'm more like I'm backing them up. I'm not supposed to take the spotlight at all. And I just want them to be happy with what I do. And so that's a little bit different than a collaboration. So if I'm on stage with Cheryl or Jonathan or Tom Paxton, what I want to do is compliment what they're doing and make what they're doing sound better. I don't want the attention drawn to me at all. So it's a different kind of a approach than it is with say Amy and I, where we're both, you know, kind of equally drawing the attention. Mm -hmm. That's a different, I don't know if that answered the question. No, no, it do, it absolutely does. I mean, it's, 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 uh, in one of my books, I have a chapter called Know Your Role. You know, you yeah. have to know you have to know your role in, in situations. And the more the more identified it is for you, the more you identify it, the easier it'll be to carry it out and to make it and to make it shine. And and I and I think that, yeah, absolutely made all sorts of sense. I, I, okay, I good. <laughs> no, it absolutely. So I want to pivot just a little bit before I let you go. I, I have tons of questions, but I'm gonna try and truncate them. Um 
just yesterday prepping for this for this chat, I, I was inspired to grab my guitar and tune it down to Dad Gad and play and just mm -hmm. play, you know, just because I haven't yeah. I haven't played in Dad Gad in ages. And and you mentioned Dad Gad earlier, D A D G A D, but but can you for the guitar heads who are listening to this, can you talk about what different tunings do and what they mean for players and composers? And also how might a new newer player use a different tuning to compose and play guitar? Hmm. Well, there, there are, you know, different tunings probably have different advantages, but I, I've gotten to the point now where it's, it's all about what open strings are available to me. Um, and, and it's, it's hard to explain, you know, like for a beginner, a tuning like dadgad or even just open D might be really nice because they can play all the chords they need with one finger, you know, mm -hmm. and, and get beautiful chords without having to work too hard. Um, whereas like standard tuning involves a little bit more physical work. Um, neither one of the tunings are necessarily better than the other. They just have different sounding open strings. So dad mm -hmm. has a very modal quality. And when you start playing in that, you know, at least for me, I, I want to play all these sort of magical sounding things. You know, when I pick up a guitar in standard, I tend to play more bluesy and jazz kind of, I don't know why it's just a, a thing and then like Amy will pick up a guitar that's tuned in some weird tuning and she'll just come up with all of these cool chords that are almost like piano chords because mm -hmm. of the of the distance between the lowest string and the highest string that kind mm -hmm. of thing so a lot of times it's it's what your ear is looking for like what what do you want to hear um what kind of quality are you looking for and uh, I think it's fun to just experiment with different tunings you know um it's it's nice if you don't have to break strings tuning in and out of them all the time but um yeah <laughs> so i usually have like you know i have a guitar usually in standard and one in dad get you know all the time sitting mm -hmm. out and then I'll, I'll tune down to c tuning or something and play in there right now i'm working on a tune that i've been working on for about five years um you keep on forgetting and i always me. work on it exactly this time of year every year and it's in bad dad tuning. wow <laughs> because because father's day is coming up so I'm, I'm, always, <laughs> I'm always working on that so check that out when you have some time it's a cool tuning yeah and, uh, I'll, I'll have to see so you got I, two d's right in the middle then. right <laughs> right i i play in dad dad in d-a-d-d-a-d -D -D -A -D. yeah that's that's yeah, so it's very similar a lot of fun mm -hmm. yeah it, it, you know and it's funny because uh this idea of playing with tunings Nobody says it has to be Eidgabi, as Rich, as Rich, my husband says. It it can be any number. <laughs> Eidgabi, yeah, that's what he calls it. He calls it Eidgabi, and you know, and I'm down. Yeah. Just, just so you know, I'm down from five guitars to one guitar. Our, our our New York apartment does not support multiple guitars, so so I only have the wow. one, and I do still have to. Uh, I I still have to shift gears and change change strings a lot when I'm when I'm fooling around with different tunings, but I'm going to have to try bad dad. That sounds, that sounds like a lot of fun. So I, I know, for example, Al, that you have videos that can teach people how to play guitar, right? Uh -huh. and, I, and I can say, and you know, and I would love to have the links for that so people can buy them uh, for the show notes, if you don't mind, but also um, yep. what, what is the best first step? What is the best first step? If somebody found a guitar in their attic, what is the best thing they can do? to start learning <laughs> well i mean assuming the guitar is playable right yeah, <laughs> yeah. Let, let, let's assume spring, let's assume the guitar is playable right um and make sure the action's not too high so you don't give up after yeah. the first five minutes yeah i i would you know i mean that's a hard question because i i'm you know after uh, playing my whole life i don't know uh when I first picked up a guitar, Beatles. It, well, no, it was before Beatles. It was <laughs> oh, just playing, <laughs> playing with, you know, like listen, you know, playing around with it. You know, you're physically when you've never played before, it's it's actually hard, hard on your fingers. And I think I I don't I I try to tell people to play stuff that is enjoyable to them, so it doesn't feel like work, doesn't mm -hmm. feel like practice. Mm -hmm. You know, like you can sit and play scales and learn your scales, but that's so boring and. So I usually, I don't teach beginning students anymore, but if I were teaching them, I would find some simple little tune that was a lot of fun to play mm -hmm. and let them work on that just to get their, 
muscle memory working, you know, mm -hmm. I, I, um, as far as my videos go, none of those are really teaching videos as much as they are. Well, they are, but they're teaching people how to play my music. So it's a little different. And you um, probably want to be a really awesome guitarist kind of before you start looking at those. Do you, do you, would you, could, but could, could somebody who's an intermediate guitar player learn how to play one of your songs or some of your tunes out sure. of, uh, okay. Okay, cool. So I want those links because yeah, I know it, it depends on yeah, I've got a couple of different DVDs that are um, in dadgad tuning, and generally that tuning is a little easier, especially mm -hmm. on your left hand. Right. You know, so that that is a lot of the technique that I'm teaching that's difficult isn't where you put your fingers. It's more about how you use your right hand and um, things like that. So, I mean, it's really, it is, that tuning is a really friendly tuning. Or like yeah. the one you you were saying, you like the dad, dad. That's like, you know, Sweet Judy Blue Eyes, you know, right. Stephen Stills. It's, you can jam on that in some sort of Eastern, Eastern mode for hours. And yeah. fun. it's like playing a cigar, you know. Yep. So. And I and I've done that. I have songs just like that in 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 dad, dad tuning. Mm -hmm. And it's and it's delightful. Mm -hmm. It, it's so it's yeah. ridiculously easy to play and so <laughs> why not do it right uh, so well, yeah and the thing is it, it that, that's what i'm saying if it's easy it's good you're gonna have more fun mm -hmm. you know, so. yeah i tell my voice anyway, students so that too I, you know i do the same i do the same thing i i they're like oh we're gonna have to sing arias no unless you want to sing arias i would rather have you learn a song you love to sing so that you'll be happy to keep practicing it than to mm -hmm. make you sing a song that you don't really want to sing. So, so I completely understand well, what you're you can, talking about there. Right. You just work, you can work up to whatever you want to do, but yeah, it's, I think it's, uh, it's important not to, uh, I think there's always this inside part of all of us that wants to already know how to do it. And so we try to go too fast. You know, right. it's almost like you want to, I want to be there now. I want to play all the songs I like right now, you know? Yeah. And I think it's important to just lay back and have a good time learning the, the feel of the instrument before you actually progress to the point where you can play all the songs you wanted to play, whatever. I don't know. It's yeah. just a personal thing. But, but I can I can totally see that. I can totally see that. And in fact, something something you told me again a long time ago. Um, when we were, well, it's been a long time. <laughs> I know, seriously. But this is this is like in the '90s, sometime. And I had come to you for a lesson, and my fingers were killing me. And you and you said you did this exercise with me that I just thought was brilliant. You had me put my finger oh, just yeah. gently on the string, and then pluck. And then you said press a tiny bit harder, and then pluck, and then a little bit harder. And I, I ended up going through like six iterations of pressing until my finger just barely touched the fret and there was sound. And then you said, that is as hard as you should ever have to press. And I went, wow. That's right. I, and it, is, it isn't hard at all. I mean, it's physically very light. And the biggest problem is trying to match your right hand to that. And, get, and, and I later on, I learned that by relaxing my right hand, I could get more volume from that. So it sounds counterintuitive, but the more relaxed you are, the more strength you have. You have more muscle that can contract, so you have more strength. And so that gives you more volume, more tone, more control, and less damage on your joints and your you know, tendons and everything. Ah, oh, that's fabulous. And it, it also is all an almost zen-like quality. To that technique mm -hmm. you know I, I it's just amazing so i would love to talk to you about that about about how how you approach the guitar as a master player you know is it just oh i play guitar or is there something more i don't know the the, the word that keeps coming to my mind is spiritual for you when when approaching one of your guitars to play it there's a there's a there's I have two different brains I think when it comes to that one of them is the brain where I uh, I come with no expectations whatsoever I sit down I pick up the instrument and I just start playing and some of my best stuff comes out when I'm in that frame of mind mm -hmm. um, where I don't I don't even know what I'm going to play I don't say well I'm going to play in this key or that key I just start playing and 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 that's like what you were talking about almost a really more like a, a Zen kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And sometimes 
I, I mean, I just saw something online on, on Instagram with uh, John Leventhal. He hadn't played in a couple of weeks and he, and he put up this little two minute piece that he, he just turned the mics on and started playing and played to the end of it and stopped. And that's all it was. And it was beautiful. And of course he's a great guitar player, but I, it made me think, it made me think, yeah, that's actually what it, some of the best stuff I've come up with is when I'm not, I'm not coming down and saying, I'm going to pick up the guitar. I'm going to write a tune in E and it's going to be this kind of tune. I mean, I can do that. That's one kind of brain. And I, I do that if someone's saying, I have this song I want you to play guitar on. And that, so I'll come down and I'll think, okay, well, it's in this key. What could I do there? What should I use the capo? Should I do? That's a technical sort of approach. Mm -hmm. And then the opposite of that is just coming down and tinkering or noodling or whatever you want to call it. Um, I think Amy on the piano would be the same way. You know, you just you start finding textures and you start finding tonalities that that sound beautiful together. And you don't have to know what you're playing at all. You just play. And I think it's really hard to get to that point until you have a certain amount of muscle memory in your fingers that they can just kind of go and, and you can just let what you're, what's in your brain flow to your fingers where you don't have to think, well, I have to push this finger here, I have to push that finger there. I think that's where I'm, I'm headed and I'm, I'm hoping to get to before I die. <laughs> but, but um, it, you know, I have moments where I'm there you know, and that's my favorite place to be, I think. Ah, oh, that's lovely. I love it. So speaking of guitars, what do you play now? What tell me about the technical stuff? What the the what strings do you use? What pickups? What and then the big thing, and this is a question that is hard for me to ask because I have my own favorite. What makes a guitar good to you? How do you know when it's a when it's a guitar you're going to want to play? Huh. When I feel it. Yeah, I think <laughs> when when you I know it's true like in a, in a good guitar doesn't have to be an expensive guitar uh -huh. um it can be one that that just speaks to you in some way i think you have to feel comfortable physically holding it um the neck has to feel good in your hand the, you know there's a physical element to all of that like in your case you you might want a bigger guitar a littler guitar it doesn't it, it you know depends on the person mm -hmm. um I tend to like smaller guitars because I like to sort of hold them on the couch and fall asleep holding them. But, uh, <laughs> but the, uh, <laughs> um, there, there are different sounds that come out of different sized bodies. You know, if it's a bigger body, you get more bass sound and less, less of the pure high notes. And I tend to like more of the pure high notes and want the bass to be more balanced. So the smaller guitar is, is more, you know, inspiring to me. It's more of a piano sort of balance as opposed to being like an electric piano that has like a big, you know, bass presence and little tinkly high end. That's, that's sort of the way I hear it is that guitar that's balanced is more like a nice Steinway, you know. Um, and and the be the better guitars do that better. I mean, you know, if you if you if you buy a nice handmade guitar by one of the better known luthiers they spend a lot of time figuring all that stuff out, you know, mm -hmm. and, and uh, they come up with a really generally with a really good uh, instrument and they can tailor it to your needs. You know, you can say, well, I don't know, that neck's a little too big. I'd like a little smaller neck and they can make you one with smaller necks. So and that's like one level. The next level is uh, the, the ones you buy in the store, the Martin, the Taylor, you know, Gibson. Those are pretty much comfortable for, a wide range of people all, all across the spectrum. And that's why they're so popular. They've figured out pretty much what most people's hands feel as being comfortable and how high the action should be. And so nowadays, you know, you can get relatively inexpensive guitars from, from those kinds of companies or from, from China, you know, that where they're copying those companies. And when I was growing up, you, you couldn't buy a decent guitar, you know, unless you spent a lot of money. It was always the really cheap stuff that had action that was a mile high. Right. Now, now even the cheap stuff's pretty good. I, I, I bought a couple of guitars recently for like a hundred bucks, brand new. And, and I'm just amazed at how good they are. You know, I had I bought one for a hundred, another one for 150. <laughs> wow. And uh, I just couldn't believe that you could even do that. I bought them just because that's how cheap they were. And I just had to see because I knew I could return it, you know, if, if I didn't like it, you know. Um, 
Can you hear all your guitars? Yeah, my guitars are ringing. They're all I'm, ringing. I'm, I'm actually speaking. talking kind of loud right now. So. Yeah, so they're all ringing back. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> I hope that comes through in in the show. I I can't hear it in my headphones, but hopefully probably it's going to come through. Yeah, <laughs> probably it's... So okay, so you what what guitars do you play though? You have several, I'm sure. What what's your what's your go to guitar now in performing or just noodling around? What are you playing most? I I have a kind of a wide range, but all of my guitars now are more what I would consider Martin style guitars you know i have i have this thing about vintage martins and so i do have a couple of old i have a 1927 or no 1926 0018 wow. that i've been playing in my concert and i you know i love it it's just one of the best sounding guitars i've ever played um and then i have you know a guitar that was made for me by martin uh recently that i love and then there's, I have a 1931 Martin that I love. So all those are really like the Martin guitars. And then I have these handmade guitars by uh, John Slobod. Um, he's got a company called Circa. Mm -hmm. And his guitars are kind of like Martins too. So they're not that much different. Um, the, the Al Petaway signature guitar that I have that Amy actually has taken over <laughs> is made by a guy named, yeah, she laughed. It's, it's probably the best guitar I've ever played and it's made out of really rare woods. And uh, it would cost in the neighborhood of $25,000 to buy one. Wow. Um, and those guitars, that's another realm when you get up there. And um, luckily I, I, I'm able to play some of those without having to come up with $25,000. <laughs> but um, that guitar is one that, you know, I don't play it as much anymore because it's kind of become Amy's guitar, but it does have my name inlaid on it and my signature on the label. So I still think of it as my guitar. <laughs> totally. <laughs> but, but I do enjoy, like the guitar that's on the stand in front of me right now is made by John Slobot Circa Guitars. Uh -huh. And, uh, and he, he did a thing for me that was really special. Um, you remember Larry Seifel? Oh, of a, course. He's a pearl inlay. Yeah, he was a pearl inlay artist. He died, you know, maybe 12 years ago, something like that. 2006, he, I think, he, um, something like that. Something, yeah, it's been a while, yeah. So he, uh, he gave me this little peg head inlay that he had done that was a reject. It had one little piece of pearl that was not as shiny as the others. <laughs> Um, and he, you know, it was a reject. So I had it around, just laid around my house in Tacoma Park and all the way up until fairly recently, just sitting around for decoration. And then this guy, when he got ready to build my guitar for me, I just asked him, I said, well, can you put this on the guitar? And he did. And so I'm looking at it right now. It's on the peg head of the guitar. Wow. And um, it's just kind of special. It's sort of like, well, little piece of Larry is still with me. And then the company that he founded, Pearlworks, um, they, he, you know, after he died, um, his wife took over and she was always feeling bad because he had been wanting to make me a guitar and a couple other people, Greg Artsner, and, and he was, um, he had left the wood and all this stuff there. And then, so she, she sort of felt bad in a way, I guess, that that never happened. And she, she and her company, had a presentation guitar built for me and for a couple other people and gave it to me. And it's covered in unbelievable inlay that, um, that represents his, his, uh, what do you call those signs? The constellations, you know, like Scorpio and mm -hmm. Capricorn. That's what's on the fingerboard. Um, one of them is Gene, one of them is his, and it's got a little Celtic moon on it. And it's just the most amazing inlay. And it's, it's some of the best woods, you know, you can possibly get on a guitar. And that one is probably one of the best sounding guitars I've ever played too, but I, I am reluctant to take it out very often. You know, it's just a special guitar. So yeah. it's kind of a Martin flavored guitar too, because I think Larry was a fan of Martin. So, I mean, that's, that's sort of a personal taste. I mean, some people really like the Gibsons and some people really like the Martins and there's nothing wrong with either one of them. They just, you know, it's whatever you kind of, <laughs> end up leaning toward. <laughs> oh, absolutely. And, you know, I, I had a Martin, I had a triple O one. And as part of moving, mm -hmm. I, I sold it 
Mm-hmm. But I still love that sound. <laughs> it's got a very specific sound. Mm-hmm. And I, the last time yeah, I, yeah. I, but I found myself not playing it, you know? So, and actually yeah. the last time I had played it a lot was when I brought it to Swananoa many, many, many moons right, ago. Right. So, um, but that actually, that makes me think, we have not talked about Swananoa. Can we talk about Swananoa yeah. Gathering for a second? You are the Guitar Week you coordinator. Can. And what, what, what is uh, the Swananoa Gathering and what do you do for it? Well, I, I actually have retired from that job. But, really? Um, I did not know that. Is, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, last year was uh, the first year that I wasn't involved. Uh, ah. And Greg, Greg Ruby, I don't, know if you, I don't know if Greg Ruby was there when you were there, but he, he's so. taken it over. Uh-huh. He's a much younger, younger guitar player, kind of a gypsy jazz player, and he's now taken over my job. But what the job is is coordinating the instructors and the classes that are offered. Uh-huh. So what I, what I would have to do every year is come up with 16 different acoustic guitar people that had a name value that would attract people. That was one of the things. And then they, they had teaching experience so they could teach what the style they played, all different styles. And then for me, I had to be able to, what we were talking about earlier, I had to like them enough that I wanted to spend a whole week with them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, I, and I didn't want to have to babysit anybody. So as a coordinator, I was always looking for guitar players that I could just trust to do their job and, and teach what they do and people would come to me and go oh he's such a great teacher i love him i love his music that's what i wanted to hear so my job was to make everybody happy including (laughs) myself now if if they do i don't know if they're doing one this year uh but if they do one will will you be a uh an instructor or are you basically just retired from it they they have they did call it off for this Mm -hmm. year and it's good because in north carolina we're we're just now starting to we're not we're not even peaking yet with the coronavirus we're still heading up wow but um so it's kind of tough here right now but th- they canceled that and uh, i was going to teach for the first time ever i was going to teach three classes and not have to do any of the coordinating I, it would have been kind of fun actually <laughs> sure so i think what they're doing is they're you know, just moving the whole thing over to 2021 and hopefully everybody that was signed up this time can still do it then you know yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's uh, so many things have have changed, um, and 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 we're changing with it. So um, I know yeah. that you again have a life to get back to. So let's uh, let's let's wind it up. Couple couple more questions. Um, okay. What are you What are you reading right now? What What books have you mm. read recently, or or articles or anything that have inspired you that you might want to share? Well, that's a that's a good question because I've, I've got I usually read about three at a time. Um, what I'm reading right now is just, and it's it's an older book, but it's just fun. It's the uh, uh, Gerald Durrell, you know, the one the series the Durrells of Corfu was based on. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's his auto. It's like his little biographical book, uh, My Family and Other Animals. It's called. Huh. Um, and then I was right before that. Let's see. I'm going to look at my my bookshelves here <laughs> oops where are they shelves okay red just read one you know because of my age and different things I just re- and amy's mom's getting older i read one called knocking on heaven's door that's really a an amazing book um, by katie butler about her parents dying and stuff that was um right before that i read the blind assassin by margaret atwood that was an amazing book you know i I just have so many different styles and a lot of times i'm reading them all at the same time i like to read autobiographies you know and uh, i read a lot of those um everyone from like phil collins to you know I, i don't know it could be any anybody's autobiography almost but um um I remember I read Prince actually even had one that he had started, but he, he never finished it. So the, right. his, the guy that was helping him write it sort of finished it for him, you know, but it was, that was pretty good. Um, you know, I, I like to get a lot of inspiration from different areas, but mostly what I read for is to kind of not escape, but to just get away from all my other thoughts and, and kind of get into someone else's world. And um, I have, you know, certain authors I really like, um, um, of course, I probably can't remember any of their names, but um, we, we, Amy and I both have been getting into Kate Morton 
lately. She's written a lot of interesting books. The Clockmaker's Daughter was one that we both just read. That's fascinating. Um, I don't know. I just go, I, I get these little things, emails every week that, you know, the books of the week and, and they'll take everything from classics to modern books and they'll have them on there for $1.99 or something. You probably are familiar with this. And it's only for one day. Uh -huh. So what I'll do is I'll go through all these and then I'll, I'll if I see something that looks interesting, I'll download it and uh -huh. you know, pay my pay my dollar or two dollars for that. Um, I do a lot of science books, you know, and um, those are I, I might be reading a science book at the same time I'm reading the autobiography of some Appalachian farmer. You know, I mean, it's just like it just goes <laughs> all over the place. Um, and I have because of the music. I play, uh, you know, I'm interested in some of that history, um, mm -hmm. you know, Scottish uh, people coming to this area of the Appalachian Mountains and settling, and and so that kind of stuff interests me to a point, and, and you know, so I do some historical fiction. I've read a lot of Alice Hoffman. I don't know if you're familiar with her. Sure. She's, yeah, she's written a lot of sort of magical, somewhere in between magic and uh, reality, but sisters, I don't read, you know, I, I read I read some books too that would be considered more like young adult books. I just really I enjoy not having to to get a lot of you know real life in my books. <laughs> right. Sometimes it's the, nice the, to the have the we, fantasy. Yeah. Yeah, the one we we read recently, Amy and I both read that we really loved. That was a specific kind of bad life, but it was really great. It was uh, where the crawdads sing. Did you ever read that? I don't think it's, so. It's called Delia, uh, Where the Crawdads Sing, and it's Delia Owens is her name, and that was that was an amazing um, thing, yeah. So, I don't know. I just, I'm just scanning through some of the ones I've already read. I've got a, a, probably a couple hundred still to read here on this list. So. <laughs> well, you know, you keep yourself busy. And, it, and reading, it's so inspiring. I find reading really, it inspires me. It inspires me to do other creative things, you know. So, so before I let you go, I have just one more question. And okay. I want to, I want to, I want to thank you and Amy and the critters <laughs> for for joining me today before i ask this last question i really really appreciate you taking the time it's so it's so lovely to catch up with you but also to 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 get a chance to to talk to you about your music and your art so i'm really really grateful that you took the time to join me on the show the question this is a question that i ask everybody who comes on the show it's a silly little question but it's one that i like to ask and here it is if you had a plane and you could skywrite anything for the whole world to see, what would you say? Uh, love one another. Ta-da. Okay. <laughs> you know, all you it, need. It, that is. The it Beatles is. were right. <laughs> <laughs> the Beatles were right all along. You know, it, it's actually really funny because the other the other day, one of the one of my other guests said to me, "Well, what would you say, Isolde?" And I, I'm like, of all the interview, interviews I've ever done, no one's ever asked me that. And and the thing that came right out of my mouth was, "Be kind." Yeah, be kind. That's. I mean, that's it, really. You know. So. And, and I mean, it, you don't have to agree with each other. Exactly. Just be nice. Just be be nice. nice. There you go. There you be go. nice. That'd be easy. Yeah. I know. I know. <laughs> it's like right? what I'm telling my. It's what I'm telling the dogs when they when they you know, are, are playing too hard. Come on, be nice. <laughs> yeah, and, and they that's... listen so well. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, again, I want to thank you so so very much for joining me. I I hope that this was fun for you. It was a delight for me. This has been. Al Petaway and Amy White for a little bit, joining me on the Creative Mindset Podcast. Thank you again both for joining me. This is Isolde Trachtenberg. And if you are enjoying what you've heard, let me know. Get in touch with Al Petaway and Amy White. Oh, and I did not say that they have websites and Instagram, and I'm going to put all of that on the show notes. So look on the show notes for all of that information because you're going to want to find more about their music, music like Sundog, music like Caledon Wood, music like Desert Dance, so many different pieces of music that you are going to love. So you're going to need to find them, and I'm going to put all of the stuff on the show notes. And leave a review of the show. If you like it, please let me know if you want to hear more of a different, um, 
a different kind of interview because I am, as always, interviewing creative peak performers to find out more about them and how they do their magic so that I can bring some of that magic to you too. And I hope that you enjoyed this episode as much as I enjoyed it the first time we recorded it and also listening to it back now as I brought it to you. It is a joy and an honor and a privilege to have known Al since for, th for over 30 years. And I send all my love to Amy and to his daughters, Leah and Sarah, and to all of the people I know who love this man uh, for his kindness, for his generosity, for his spirit, for his incredible artistry and music and for the grace of the magic of being him. So, uh, yeah, go out and make music today. Go out and listen to music. Listen to some of Al's music from early on all the way to the very last stuff he recorded. And Amy has promised there will be more, which I'm incredibly excited to have because I have everything they've ever put out and just incredible, incredible, incredible person. And... uh it always just reminds me that, that my notion, the thing that I say at the very end of every episode, holds so true. Be bold, be creative, and most of all, be kind. That's Al. <laughs> that's really, you know, that's Al. Like he said, uh, his the thing that I ask at the end of every episode for of everybody is the airplane question. You know, if you had an airplane that could skyrocket anything for the whole world to hear, what would you say? He said, love one another. And uh, and then he goes, that's all you need. The Beatles were right. And so uh, that's it. So with, with that notion in mind, I add, be bold, be creative, be kind, and love one another in honor of Al Petaway. Thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate you being here. Please subscribe to the podcast if you're new, and it would mean the world to me if you told a friend about it. Today's episode was produced by Isolde Trachtenberg and is copyright 2023. As always, please remember this is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Past performance does not guarantee future results, although we can always hope. Until next time, keep living what you believe in. Thank you.